I'm turning this morning to the book of Isaiah and chapter 1. The book of Isaiah and chapter 1. And I read verse 18 of that first chapter. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And a wonderful promise in the Old Testament here in this wonderful book of Isaiah. So many wonderful promises we have in the Old Testament. Never neglect the Old Testament. So many wonderful promises of God. And one here in particular in verse 18 of Isaiah chapter 1. That if we come, that if we repent of our sins, the Lord will wash us clean. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And isn't it amazing that God, who is the offended party, God who is the one who is offended by our sins, He is the one to come and say, let us reason together. He is the one to take the initiative. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And in the short time we have this morning, I just want to consider this wonderful verse and the wonderful promise that we have from this verse. Now, really we have here a picture of dress. Though our sins, though we are dressed, as it were, in scarlet, we can be dressed in white. Though we are dressed in crimson, we can be dressed in the colour of wool. And it's an easy picture for us all to understand from the youngest to the oldest because the world sets a great bar by how we are dressed. It's important how we are dressed. If we go to a a wedding, we are dressed appropriately for a wedding. If we go to meet somebody important, we dress accordingly. And if we go to school or if if we have a special job where we need specialist equipment and Um, particular types of dress then it's important that we have that particular type of dress so it's a very easy picture for us to understand and the world sets a great bar doesn't it by how we're dressed physically how we look is very important in the eyes of the world and people will spend thousands of pounds to try and look the best that they can and particularly the celebrity culture that we have now in these days the social media culture it's all about how we look how do our bodies look? What's our hair look like? What, do our, what does our skin look like? Everything's so important about how we look. What is on the surface? And really, this, this morning, I want to think about how, what, do, what do our souls look like? What we all, it's important how we dress, of course. It's, it's, it's of relevance. But what do we look like to God? What do we look like in the eyes of God? If God was to look at, as God looks upon us, what, what do our souls look like? How are we dressed? How is our soul dressed? Not just how our body is dressed, our, our body that will die, our physical body that will one day be dust. What is left in our soul? How are we dressed? How do we look before God? Now I was reading this week about a man called Lewis Hamilton. You may have heard of him. You may not have heard of him, but he's a a racing car driver, he gets paid millions of pounds to drive a car around a track as fast as he can and he does it very well there's no doubt about that but you know, when you're rich and famous the the irony is that you get invited to lots of things that you don't have to pay for so you get the best seats in many concerts and sporting events and you get them for free even though you could pay but Lewis Hamilton was given tickets to the final at Wimbledon and he was given uh, not just tickets to the final at Wimbledon but he was given tickets to the best seats and he was not just given tickets to the best seats but he was given tickets to the Royal Box and Lewis Hamilton therefore could sit at Wimbledon he could watch the final at Wimbledon but he could watch it next to the Queen or Prince William or whoever of the Royal Family attends the Wimbledon final and he was very happy about this and he, he boasted about it he put it on social media he took a picture of the, of the invitation and Lewis Hamilton went to see Wimbledon but when he got there they refused him entry they said no Lewis you can't come in and he said why 
And they said, because you're not wearing a jacket and you're not wearing a tie. You can't come in, that's the rules. That, that, that is the rules and you are not allowed in. And so therefore, Lewis Hamilton, as rich as he is, as famous as he is, as important as he is in the eyes of the world, he got to the sporting event that he was invited to and he wasn't allowed in because he wasn't wearing the right thing. And the question is for us, when we come to meet God, when we stand before him in judgment, when we come to the door, as it were, of heaven, when the Lord looks upon us, will we be wearing the right thing? Will we be clothed appropriately for the eternal heavens? Are we wearing the right thing? Are we clothed in white or are we clothed in scarlet and crimson? And so it's an important question for us this morning to consider. Well, it would be uh, incomplete, wouldn't it, this morning if we didn't think about the saints already in heaven? The saints already in heaven and the people there. What do they wear? What do they wear? It would be a, a question we need to answer. And luckily for us, the Lord has blessed us with the book of Revelation. And in Revelation we learn what the people that stand before God wear. We have in the book of Revelation the 24 elders. And the first thing we learn about the 24 elders in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation is that they stand before the Lord, every one of them, wearing white robes and crowns of gold on their heads. So the elders there wear white robes. If you were to fast forward to chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, you would see the martyrs. When the, when the Lord opens the fifth seal, he sees under the altar the John who has the revelation, the vision of revelation. He sees under the altar all the saints of God who have been killed for their faith and for the testimony which they held. And they said, they prayed to the Lord. They say, Lord, how long? O oh God, how long, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood on them which are upon the earth? And the Lord says, well, first of all, he gives every, to every one of them white robes, white robes. And it's said to them that they should rest for a season. And so everybody that is to be killed for their faith, that's everybody who is to lose their life, until all that takes place and all that is fulfilled, they should rest yet for a little season. So the elders are clothed in white robes, the martyrs are clothed in white robes, and then in the wonderful seventh chapter of Revelation, you have the great multitude, the great multitude, the saints from the Old and New Testaments, every saint that's ever lived, the church as it were, every saint clothed and standing before the Lord, standing before him. And in the book of Revelation, it's, it's interesting, but John is having the vision of Revelation. John is having this vision of heaven. And one of the elders says to John, where have all these people come from? What are these people who are arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? That's interesting, isn't it? You would think the question would be the other way around. Well, the elder's not asking because he doesn't know. He's asking because he wants John to think about it. And John says, well, sir, you know. You know where they've come from. You know why they are arrayed in white. And we have a wonderful answer from the elder. The elder says, these are they which have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They've had their robes washed. They've had their souls washed. Their sins are washed. And they are standing there in white. This means they stand before God and they have no sin. They have no fault. They are there without spot or without blemish. And so therefore in the book of Revelation, the elders, the martyrs, the saints, everyone that's ever trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and everyone that ever will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is arrayed in white and stands before the throne. So we ask ourselves the question, what are we wearing now? Because the Lord says here, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall be as wool. And it's a significant question for each one of us here this morning. Am I standing, as it were, in white before the Lord, or am I standing in scarlet and crimson? Well, why is our sins red? 
Why are our sins described by the Lord as red and crimson? You would think maybe it would be black. But you know, that, this picture for us is a picture of the Old Testament where they had this, uh, according to the experts, an insect where they would take the, the, the dye out of the insect and this would create the basis of their dye for their clothes and they would maybe get a white piece of cloth and they would dye it with this dye and they would put the dye in the water and they would soak the, the piece of cloth and they would take that out again and let it dry and then they maybe would dye it again and they would maybe have something there which was called a double dye. But in those days, if you took your piece of clothes and you dyed it with this dye, it was, it was done. It was permanent. They didn't have washing machines like we have. Even our washing machines don't get half the stains out that we want them to get out. In those days, this was done. This was a dye, and it was hard and fast. It was cast. And the piece of clothes, well, the, pe- the clothing could not be changed after that. No amount of washing would get that stain out, those, that, that dye. And so we have this picture of scarlet, dye, dye. And that's a great picture for us of our souls because the Bible tells us that our soul is stained. Our soul is stained with sin. Our clothes can get stained with dirt and our souls are stained with sin. The dirt of sin. Because sin makes us dirty and unclean. And the Bible is quite clear that our sin makes us unclean. And every sin that we have committed makes us unclean. Even if we just had one sin It would be enough to make us unclean. Our sins are as scarlet. So we can't get this dye out. What else is red? Red is a a very obvious colour. If you could imagine a a whole class of children or something like that, or a whole stadium full of people, and they were all dressed in white, but just one of them was red. When When your eye casts across, it's very obvious that just the one thing that's red... It's very clear and very obvious. Sin is a very... uh, Red is a very obvious colour. Red stands out. It's very bright. And in the same way, our sin is a very obvious thing. Just like red is an obvious colour to see, sin is a very obvious thing. And the truth is this morning is that if you're here and you haven't trusted in the Lord, maybe you're blind to your own sin. Maybe you cannot see your own scarlet sins. But... I can guarantee you'll see those sins in other people. When you look at other people, when you see other people's behaviour, we'll be very quick to point out their sins. We'll be very quick to see selfishness in other people. We're very quick to see other people's rudeness and things like that. So we're very quick and easy to see other people's scarlet sins. But maybe we're blind to our own. So just like red is a very obvious colour, a very bright colour, Our sins are so shocking and obvious to other people, even if not to ourselves, but how much more to God? When God looks upon us, our sins are so obvious. He knows them. He knows us. He knows our every thought. He knows our every deed. He knows our motivation. We may try and hide our motivations to other people. We may think we've done something kind, but really we know we didn't really want to do it. And so we can cover our motivations to other people, But the Lord knows our hearts. The Lord knows exactly why we do things, why we do them. And the Lord knows our sin. And so to him, our sins are obvious. He knows every single one of our sins that we've ever committed. He knows the sins that we will commit this going forward in our lives. And so to him, our sins are obvious. And red is obvious. Red is also quite a shocking colour, isn't it? Red is a a shocking colour. We... We, it's not a pale colour. We, if you go into somebody's house and the walls are all red, it's, it's, it's quite a shocking thing. It's, it's dramatic. And our sins are shocking and dramatic. We may not see them ourselves, but to God, anything that is against this holy law, anything that violates the Ten Commandments, is a, is a shocking thing to Him. And it must be covered. It must be cleansed. Red is the colour of danger. Red is the colour of danger. Even little children might watch something like Fireman Sam, a children's TV program. And they have a song in that program, I've, I've heard it many times. Red is for danger. Red is for danger. That's the song that they sing at the fire station. And we learn 
about red being a danger. Red is a colour of danger. Now, I work in research, I work in presenting data and things like that in, in graphs and charts, and we have training on that kind of thing, and we have how to present something effectively, how to present some data effectively, and one of the things that the, the trainer said is that you shouldn't put red in a graph unless it's bad news. Don't put red in a graph unless you're trying to draw attention to something that needs fixing. Because we're so used these days to having like traffic lights in, in businesses when they have um, key performance indicators. It would be green, yellow or red. And if it's red, well it needs urgent action. If it's red, it needs to be done, something done about it. And if we have red in a chart, it means something bad as opposed to something positive. And so our sins, in the same way, are danger. They should spell danger to us. If we are not forgiven, if we have not been cleansed, our sins put us in great danger of the judgment. And we must come and we must have our sins forgiven before we die. Our sins must be washed away before the Lord comes again. Or else it will be too late. You have that man at the wedding feast that we read in Matthew chapter 22. Everybody went to that wedding. And many of the experts think that as they went to that wedding, they were given a garment to wear. All they had to do was accept that garment and to wear that garment. And this man refused. And when the, when the Lord came in, he saw the, the, the king came in. He saw that that man was not wearing a wedding garment and that spelled danger for him, imminent danger. And that man was taken out from the wedding and cast into outer darkness. So we cannot trifle with sin. Sin is obvious, it's shocking, it's dangerous and we must deal with it. We must have it dealt with before we go to the judgment. But we do have this wonderful promise this morning. Though our sins are as scarlet, if you're here this morning and you're thinking, well, my sins haven't been dealt with, I'm still in my sin, I've never asked for forgiveness, I've never sought the Lord in repentance, well, there's a great promise for you here this morning. Though they are as scarlet, they can be white as snow. So, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ has made a plan of salvation. He has come to execute this plan. And it's no coincidence, is it, that when the Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth, he lived a perfect life. When the Lord Jesus Christ took upon him flesh, when he was upon this earth, he had no sin. He had no sin. And so his robe, his, his, his soul was perfectly pure. His soul was perfectly white. His, perf his soul was perfectly clean. And so that is the model. That is perfection, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's no, of, it's no coincidence that when he went to Calvary's cross, when the Lord Jesus Christ, in his perfection, went to Calvary's cross, what did they put on him? But well, they put on him a scarlet robe. A scarlet robe. You would read that in Matthew 27. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. You know the people did that because they were mocking him. Oh, you're a king. You say you're a king. They put on him a scarlet robe, the colour of purple. The other gospels say it was purple. Matthew tells us it was scarlet. Well, it's probable that they put on him a scarlet robe because it was the closest thing they had to purple. But they were doing it to mock him. You say you're a king? Ha! Huh. Here's, a, here's a robe, here's a crown. They mocked him when they crucified him. But the Lord fulfilled his purposes and it gave us a great picture of how the Lord Jesus would take our sins on Calvary's cross. And your sins, though they are as scarlet, are placed, if you trust in him, if you repent of your sin, your scarlet sins are placed on him. He wears your scarlet robe when he goes to Calvary's cross. And even more wonderful than that, his righteousness is given to you. And so you're swapped around. His righteousness to you, your sins to him. He wears the scarlet robe. And what does Isaiah tell us in Isaiah chapter 61? I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with righteousness. 
He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So you are covered. If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in him, if you ask him to forgive you of your sins, you are covered. Your sins are covered with his righteousness and they're washed away. Your sins are gone and you are cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Because the Bible says that he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 7. These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know, Charles Spurgeon used to tell a story of a beggar and a rich man. And the rich man saw the beggar and he said, come home with me, come. So the beggar went home with the rich man. And the rich man said, go upstairs and put on my suit. So the, the beggar went upstairs and he put on the rich man's suit and he came downstairs and he said, how do I look? And the rich man said, you look fair, you look amazing. And the beggar said, well, I only look amazing because I'm wearing your suit. There's nothing else about me that's changed. And you know, in a way, that's a, a picture of the gospel, isn't it? A dirty, a filthy, sin-stained sinner can go and they can be clothed in uh, a suit and attire, the robes of righteousness that make us acceptable to God. We are not acceptable to God, but in Christ Jesus we are acceptable to God. In the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, and therefore we are acceptable to him. And he makes us a new creature, and he changes us and makes us fit to stand before him in glory. So we must come. We must repent. We must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. This is a, this is a gift. How do I do it? It's a gift. For by grace are ye saved through faith, says Ephesians. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of yourselves. There's nothing you can do to get the stains out of your soul. There's nothing you can do yourself. The people in those days couldn't have washed their clothes to get the stains out. They couldn't have dyed it with something else to get the stains out. There was nothing they could do. And friends, we are dead in our sins. There is nothing we can do to get the stains of sin out of our souls. The only thing we can do is come to the doctor, the physician of souls. The only thing we can do is come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all we can do. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot recognize your sin and say, well, I'm going to make an effort to scrub it clean. You cannot say from this point on, I'll try and be a good person because you are stained already. There is nothing that we can do to rid ourselves of sin other than come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a fountain filled with blood, says one of the hymns. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Wash me, wash me and I will be clean. In wonder lost, says another hymn, with trembling joy we take the pardon of our God. Pardon for sins of deepest dye. Pardon, a pardoning, a pardon brought with Jesus' blood. Who is a pardoning God like thee, or who has grace so rich and free? Well, you know, David knew the depths of sin. This was David as a Christian. This was David who had committed sins even as a Christian. But you know, when he came to pray, he prayed a wonderful prayer of repentance in Psalm 51. And one of the verses in Psalm 51 is, Wash me, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Not just as white as snow, but whiter than snow. Wash me, and I will be cleansed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you know, you must be dressed. If you know, you must be dressed for an occasion. What stops you getting dressed and ready for that occasion? If you know you're going to a wedding, what stops you being dressed ready? Are you too lazy? 
Could we be too lazy to get dressed properly as we ought to be dressed? Is the person who attends his workplace not dressed appropriately with his right attire? Could we say he was too lazy to do so? Possibly. Possibly. Is it too far-fetched to say that we're too lazy to come to the Lord Jesus Christ? We don't really want to give time to think about it. We don't really want to give time to think about our sins past. We don't want to give time to think about standing before him in judgment. We're too lazy, really, to, to think too much about Judgment Day, to think about our immortality, or our mortality, should I say, but our never-dying souls. We don't really want to give time to think about how the Lord Jesus Christ came to suffer and die, what that means for us. We're too busy with our lives. We're too busy with the things of the world. We were just talking this morning about the car boot sales. I passed three of them on the way here. Cars and cars and cars and rows and rows of fields. People wanting to go and get up and to buy things, to, to eat, drink and be merry. Anything but be here in the house of God. Too lazy to think about their souls. Well, it's possible, isn't it? When children won't get dressed in the morning, when you've got teenagers who won't get out of bed, it's because they may be too lazy. And in there's a verse in Romans, isn't there, that says, now it's high time to awake out of sleep. Stop being lazy, stop giving too much time to the world, but come and think about your soul. Think about where you will be for all eternity. Think about the consequences of your sins and think about how they must be forgiven before the Lord should come again. Why didn't Lewis Hamilton dress appropriately? Why didn't Lewis Hamilton dress in all that he needed to be dressed with? Well, maybe he didn't think. Maybe he didn't think. I, it didn't even occur to him to check well, I hope that's true of no one here this morning, that we don't really think about these things, that we're ignorant of the rules. I'm sure it's not possible, but just in case anybody is, anybody's ignorant, we rehearse it again. We have offended God. We have fallen from Him. We are dead in our sins. Our sins make us offensive to Him. They are as scarlet in His sight, but He is willing. He wants to reason with us. He is willing that we should come to him. He is willing that we should be forgiven of our sins. And he is willing, he wants us to come. And he reasons with us this morning and says, if you will, come and drink. If you will, come and eat the bread of life. If you will, knock on the door and it shall be opened unto you. Maybe Lewis Hamilton was just too proud. Maybe he just thought he didn't need to. I'm Lewis Hamilton. I can do what I like. They won't stop me coming in. Surely not. I can wear just what I like. But you know, Wimbledon is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter who you are. You have to obey the rules. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in a much greater way, is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter who you are. You may think I'm important in my business. I'm important in my community. I am respected. I am a sir. I am a lord. I am a lord and a sir. I am an earl, I am a this, I am a that, I am a king, I am a queen. Everybody on that day of judgment will stand entirely equally before him. There will be no one important, nobody poor. Everybody will be the same. And everybody will give accounts in just the same way. And therefore, we cannot have an excuse. We cannot say we didn't know. And just like Lewis Hamilton, it could well be that we're too proud we're too proud to come. We're too proud to admit that we have scarlet sins. We're really too proud to admit it. We want to think that we are able to contribute something to our salvation. Oh, I'm happy to have salvation, but I also want to be able to earn it as well. I'm happy to have my sins forgiven, but I want to think that I deserve to have my sins forgiven. Oh, we have to come and admit that we deserve nothing. We have to come to the throne of God and repent of our sins, admitting that we deserve nothing. That we deserve not to have our sins forgiven. We deserve not the righteousness that he can give to us. We deserve not a place in heaven for all eternity. We deserve not for him to have come and to have suffered and to die on the cross. We deserve none of these things. And yet, Lord, I will accept it as a gift. I will accept it as a free gift of God. And I will take it. And I will be clothed and covered. And my sins washed away. Well, maybe Lewis Hamilton didn't think. Maybe he was too proud. Maybe we're too lazy. 
The man that didn't take his wedding garment in that Matthew chapter 22 reading, why didn't he take his garment? All he had to do was to take it and to wear it and he could have stayed at the wedding feast but he wouldn't. He wouldn't. Maybe he thought that the man, the, the king, would let him off. Maybe he thought, well, that's what I should wear, but it doesn't really matter. There's so many times in this life that we're, we're conditioned to think like this. Because there are so many times in this life when the rules are disobeyed and nobody cares. When the rules are disobeyed and everybody gets away with it. There's so many times when that happens. When we're, we live on a road which is a 20 mile an hour zone. But people go down there at 50 sometimes, 40, 50, and nobody does anything about it. But you can get away with it. There are signs that say, don't do this, and everybody does it, so it doesn't matter. So often, there are things like that where we know what we should do, but we get away with not doing it, so we don't do it. And in the same way, we may think, well, I know I must have my sins forgiven, but so often we think we can get away with it. The Lord, when he sees me, will not judge me for my sin. He will be kind. He will will forgive me on the day of judgment. He will sweep my sins under the carpet. There are so many... Surely God is good and God will cast nobody into hell. Surely not. God is somebody who is kind and will not ever do anything like that. Well, we're warned this morning. Though our sins are as scarlet, they will stay scarlet if we don't trust in him. If our sins are red like crimson, like blood, they will stay like that if we don't repent of our sins. And I just finished with the reaction of that man in Matthew 22. What was said of him when he was found not to have his wedding garments? Did he answer the man back? No. Did he justify his lack of wedding garment? No. When that man was found by the king not to have a wedding garment, the Gospel of Matthew tells that that he was speechless. He was speechless. And if we come to see God and we stand before him in our scarlet sins, in our crimson sins, We will not have an audience with him to be able to justify ourselves. We will not be able to plead our ignorance. We will not be able to say that we were those who didn't know. We will stand before him and we will be speechless. We will be speechless. And there will be no opportunity then. It will be too late. And in Revelation chapter 6, those that are unrepentant, when the Lord comes, well, all they want is for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. They hide themselves in the caves and they say, Rocks and mountains fall on us and hide us from the face of the him that sitteth upon the throne and from the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who is able to stand? You will not be able to stand before him. You will not be able to stand before him in unrepentance on that last day when he comes again to judge the living and the dead. And so he says to you, Before I come, before I come, let us reason together. Let us reason together. Come. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If you trust and if you repent in me and believe that I died for your sins, though your sins be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And that's a promise for all of us here this morning. A wonderful promise buried in this book, buried in the Old Testament, but it shines as gold shines in a dark place. A great promise for all of us here this morning. But we must come. We must repent and we must ask him to make our scarlet sins pure and white, clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived and died, that we might be forgiven of our sins. Well, may us all hear this morning, hear this message, be serious with ourselves, ask ourselves, be honest with ourselves, and if we haven't come, to come and to, to ask that we may be forgiven of our sins, that we may stand before him in that great day, being clothed, not in our own righteousness, but the righteousness of him who came from heaven to earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.